Hey guys, um, my name is Joy Deep. Uh, I work at a company uh, named Cubol. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff about what we are building. Um, so thanks to I guess uh, let me give a thanks to Fifth Elephant for you know uh, uh, letting us present some of the uh, uh, our talk here. Um, or you know the th things that we're doing. Okay, I'm getting nervous. Uh, <laughs> all right, so um, let me give you a little bit of background about uh, you know who we are, what we are trying to build, um, uh, and what's the context for uh, this talk. So, um, and I'll give a somewhat uh, personal narrative on this because that's uh, the easiest way for me to narrate the story. <coughs> um, I remember I uh, first played around with the cloud in 2009. Uh, I was on paternity leave and I uh, came back to India. I just sort of logged into AWS and said, okay, I was working on Hive at that time and said, uh, let me make work Hive, uh, let me make Hive work on the cloud. So, um, and that was a, a, you know, a very, like, uh, eye-opening experience for me. So I come from the world of, you know, NetApp and Oracle, sort of working on like sort of big honking sort of uh, you know enterprise class systems, and then here you had this sort of like uh, you know uh, hardware on the fly, storage on the fly, and it was just like magical. And uh, I think I'd always sort of at the you know back of my mind uh, wanted you know when I had sort of like finished up my gig at uh, Facebook to so sort of come back, come out and like say okay, like, you know, let me build some stuff for the cloud. So that's sort of one part of it. I just find that cloud is like really really cool. So. Uh, that was kind of the next slide. I mean, I, I think you guys know all this stuff, right? So uh, you can get uh, hardware on demand. Uh, you can expand and shrink uh, as you wish. Um, it's cheap. Um, uh, not the cheapest, uh, but there are like magical things like spot instances, you know, like you can bid for stuff. I mean, that's kind of amazing, right? Um, and it's kind of infinite storage, right? So you just uh, sort of, uh, as much data as you want to store, you keep, you know, doing your HTTP puts and like it just stores it, right? And uh, if you ever worked in an operational uh, sort of uh, uh, you know scenario where you were actually managing boxes and capacity and all this stuff, and that's a, just such a nightmare. You know, you, you're working at a fast-paced company that's sort of growing very fast, and uh, uh, every day you have to wake up and think, oh man, like we are at 90% capacity, 95% capacity. Like, did the ops guys order enough hardware and stuff, right? So, a whole lot of like really like I would say like you know not very interesting problems. You know, somebody else is sort of taking care of those problems and. Uh, you know, we are obviously all thankful to Amazon for uh, showing us the way here, literally. Um, but the other part of me is that I'm also, I'm not just an engineer who builds things, but I'm also, uh, have played a role as uh, an analyst, right? So I've worked with business teams and uh, tried to build uh, data-driven applications. Sometimes they have been interesting ones, like, you know, like doing data mining, building recommendations and things like that. But often, like, you know, very basic stuff, like just uh, uh, building reports, um, uh, financial reports, you know, auditing stuff, uh, uh, tallying stuff up, you know, uh, uh, very mundane stuff, right? So, and, and so one thing I've, you know, always felt very deeply is that when uh, I am in the role of an analyst, um, the last thing I want to do is understand how something is implemented. So uh, there are all these, uh, you know, uh, of course I've worked with like tons and tons of database folks and uh, they're always coming up with this fancy stuff, right? I mean, oh, here's your like, you know, like the best, freaking way of doing joins. You just have to set these five, five options, right? And everything will like, just magically like, become fast and uh, beautiful, right? But, but when you are an analyst and you are doing your day job and you're analyzing data, you know, building workflows, building data pipelines, the last thing you want to think about is how something is implemented, how something is optimized. And that is where the cloud is um, really complicated, right? So, I mean, uh, I, I actually borrowed these pictures from some uh, Amazon uh, presentation on SlideShare, so it's kind of unfair to them. I mean, I think the platform is beautiful, but uh, you know, we all know it's also very complicated, right? So you, you have to learn a lot of things. You have to learn key pairs, regions, buckets. Uh, it goes on and on and on. And yeah, it's all very you know nice and interesting as an engineer, but think of yourself as an analyst sitting down there and doing your day job. I mean, what does your day job have to do with any of this stuff, right? Uh, so these are the two things that you know we, we sort of tried to b bring together. We said, okay, uh, cloud is really cool, and we want to make life for analysts like really really simple, right? Have them be able to exploit the power of the cloud. Um, what do I have here? Right. So so this is just an enumeration of okay. Well, if you want to run some Hadoop jobs or Hive jobs, you know, what are the things you have to do? You have to set up an RDS instance with your own Metastore. You have to start your own cluster, and then you are starting wondering, okay, well, you know. How many nodes do I want? You know, what kind of nodes? Large, extra large, cluster compute, spot, on demand. Well, spot, you know, how much should I bid? What if I don't get the bids? 
what if the instance just disappears underneath me? Even if you actually understand all these concepts, I mean, even just getting there is a is a is a is a, is a, is a quite a bit, right? So uh, so it's pretty complicated, right? So so what's the way out, right? And, and so so the, what I'm going to do in this presentation is talk a little bit about um, what we have built. I I don't think I'll be able to do justice and present everything. So I'll try to uh, focus uh, a little bit deep into some of the specific technologies that we have built, uh, but. The general understanding I want to convey is that these are part of an overall spectrum of things that we are working on, right? Uh, all right, so this is kind of, if you, uh, if you signed up for our uh, application and you just logged in via the browser, uh, this is what you would see. You know, you would see a dashboard where you see, okay, these are the Hadoop jobs, Hive jobs we have run, that's their status, you can go and look up, you know, the results and everything, and what you would not see is, uh, you know, how many nodes do I need or, uh, you know, do I need to first get this data into HDFS or, you know, things like that. So you, you focus on your business logic, right? That's your day job. We focus on the infrastructure. That's our day job, right? All right, so, okay, so, you know, simple things, right? I mean, dead simple. I mean, I, I'm, I feel ashamed of putting up this UI because it's nothing. It's just a Hadoop job tracker page, right? But but you see this page is actually from uh, like, uh, you know, almost like a month old, you know, some query I ran like a month back, and I can just like click and pull it up. Uh, I don't have any instances running in uh, Amazon. Uh, this is just a managed environment where uh, the Cubol data service has managed to sort of store the logs away in the right locations. You click on it and you just see it, right? Pretty, very, very basic stuff. So, uh, so, so as I said, you know, what, what I will try to do in this talk is, um, focus deep down on a few, a couple of things that uh, to me are very interesting uh, uh, from a technological point of view and um, just leave the rest to sort of, you know, maybe discuss afterwards or you can go to our website and stuff. So, so auto scaling is one thing that, uh, the, one of the first things we built, right? So, so we have this goal of, you know, making life really easy, right? But, so you write, write in a query, uh, so, so by the way, obviously the background here is that, you know, most of this stuff is like Hive and Hadoop, right? So you're coming in, sitting down, writing a Hive query, right? So the first question is, you know, how many nodes, right? What kind of nodes? How much memory? Um, so on and so forth. So auto scaling is obviously a very, very like simple and uh, basic primitive. All of us know it. You know, we we are all happy users of it for the web tier. Uh, but it turns out uh, it's not that easy for uh, for Hadoop. So I'll ta talk a little bit about why it's not easy. But let's see on at least how it's supposed to work. So uh, you are Nuco. Uh, you, you know, you are a customer of ours. Um, uh, you get a virtual cluster. So you you log in and say, okay, yeah, there's always a cluster available. You fire a query, it uh, turns out to be a query on a very small table, and uh, we bring up a small cluster for you. So you don't have to think about it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, some other analyst comes in, or maybe you, know, you yourself sort of uh, fire a second query, and you run a query on a much larger table, right? What happens? Uh, we size the cluster up. Right? Again, you didn't have to think about it. We were actually able to uh, multiplex uh, two compute jobs onto the same set of nodes, which is always good, right? Um, queries finish, right? And we get the, you know, get rid of the machines, right? So one of the smart things we do is, uh, you already paid the machine, uh, paid for the machines for the hour, right? So we will keep them running for an hour because you already paid for them. Uh, in the chance that you were just taking a coffee break and you were to, going to come back, uh, you would, you know still have your cluster and your resources available. Of course, it will be all transparent. It's just that, you know, those things will be a little bit faster for you, right? And after some time, you know, if none of your users are active, then uh, everything is just gone, right? So, so w what you see here is that, you know, you, our customers have been able to focus on the business logic and we have been able to focus on, uh, you know, provisioning, deprovisioning machines, how many, what type, uh, optimizing on cost, making sure that, you know, you get your money's worth and so on and so forth. Um, Another sort of, uh, you know, very uh, uh, sort of natural tendency that happens in companies is that if you are a, sort of a, a cloud intensive, uh, uh, you're using a cloud a lot, you know, you start with one job, two job, you um, write some flows and stuff, right? But very soon, you know, you get quite a few of them, right? And why not? I mean, we, we all know this, right? So you, you start using some infrastructure, you, you should anticipate uh, a lot of growth in that. So over time, what you will find is that, you know, there are these like machine generated jobs, there are these human generated jobs, and all of them are, you know, spawning their own clusters, their own machines, they are doing stuff, right? And um, I was talking to a, a you know, a, a friend and a customer uh, in the Bay Area, and he was saying that he had done some analysis on, um, uh, on his, the machines and the instances that they were using. And he said, you know, we have, like, maybe, like, at 40% like, utilization, right? 
It doesn't make any sense because, you know, everybody is coming in and starting up their own machines. Now, instead, if everybody was going to the same set of machines, now you get, like, way better utilization, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, while John has spawned up a Blick cluster and half an hour into the hour his job is done, those resources are still available for use by other people. And that's how you get efficiency. And, uh, and so, so one of the things that he was telling me was that, hey, you know, I wish I could, you know, send everything to one place, but I don't know how to scale this up and down, and you guys have solved that. So, so such, such a simple thing, you know, auto-scaling is like, you know, is a word we all know, but, you know, solving that simple problem uh, uh, turns out to be a very big win for most organizations. Uh, oh, yeah, this is for my kid. Uh, she loves, like, happy faces, so <laughs> everybody's happy, right, when we do this. Um, so uh, just to add a little bit of, like, from the technology point of view, like, why is this not a simple problem? So, uh, uh, so normally, you know, when you are like doing auto scaling for like web tier, uh, your uh, your load is like reasonably smooth, right? So you can say, okay, well, if I'm trending up, uh, if I've had high CPU usage for some amount of time, then it's most likely that I will have high CPU usage going forward as well. And so you can make a decision to uh, add nodes, for example, right? But uh, Hadoop is not like that, right? I mean, uh, these batch systems are extremely bursty and um, the fact that you are at 100% CPU for the last five minutes actually means nothing. You could be at absolutely 0% CPU the very next second. Or for that matter, um, you could uh, <clears throat> uh, be at 0% CPU and still be sort of bottlenecked because, you know, what you are doing is network I.O. or something like that, right? So, uh, so what we have done is, uh, since, you know, we have a lot of uh, sort of experience working within the stack, we've actually gone inside the stack and sort of, you know, written code inside the job tracker to sort of, you know, look at all the queues and stuff and what's going on. Okay, you know, if we were to let the, the, the current set of jobs and queries run with the hardware resources that we have right now, uh, you know, how much time would it take into the future? And is that time acceptable? And if it is not, then, you know, well, let's go ahead and, like, uh, fire up some more machines, right? Uh, so, a and actually, the funny part is adding nodes is actually easy. Um, the, the, the it's even harder to delete nodes because, uh, uh, these systems are fault tolerant, but only to a limit. If you uh, if you have a large job that is that has one task waiting, like you know everything is run, so a thousand tasks, uh, one reducer waiting, right? Because it's kind of like chomping on some stuff. Um, you uh, take out some nodes, thinking that you are kind of done, right? I mean, well, 99% of your job is done. You take out most of the nodes, and the system will completely fall on its face because Hadoop will think that all the intermediate data has disappeared. And this is kind of ridiculous, but like that's how we, the way the, the system works. It's going to rerun everything to rematerialize the, that intermediate data. So you have to be very careful about how you uh, remove nodes. You have to decommission nodes from HDFS so that the file system does not go into a corrupted state, and so on and so forth. There's some references to caching here. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the caching uh, uh, in, in some of the subsequent uh, slides. Um, other interesting things. Uh, so I briefly mentioned about spot instances. Well. If you have a, a cluster with a mix of spot and core instances, um, how do you place data? Because you know, you know that spot instances can disappear any time, right? I mean, uh, it's just a matter of like waiting long enough or for you to hit one unlucky day. So, so you know, simple rule. Okay, well, uh, maybe if it's data that I actually want to hang on to, then maybe I should um, keep one copy always on one of my core nodes. So, they, because you know, hopefully they'll never never disappear. Um, so there's, uh, you know, a fair amount of, like, sort of interesting engineering stuff that uh, is required to just make, like, this very simple primitive uh, work. Uh, the, so the other thing I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about is uh, uh, cloud storage, because, you know, that's the sort of the, the, the other big thing, right? I mean, it's an infinite amount of storage, uh, and that's beautiful, right? But, but that comes with its cost, right? Um, so I, I, I'm sure you can find a lot more sort of, like, research on the web. Uh, if you take S3, you know, and say, okay, well, how does, how does S3 compare to uh, uh, my local drives or to HDFS that, you know, uses those local drives, right? And I'm just presenting some sort of back of the envelope numbers that we have gotten when we have done some testing. Uh, uh, you know, they're like 4x slower than local drives. Uh, uh, it's very, very slow on uh, small files. Uh, Seeks are very, very expensive because, you know, you have to do, uh, open up a new HTTP connection and sort of like, you know, uh, uh, so, so, there's uh, some charts here. Uh, Vinayak was talking about uh, what not to do for visualization, and I think this chart is like <laughs> everything that he said 
we should not do. But anyway, uh, what you can see here is that you know S3 is the the run times on S3 are the blue lines, and the run times on HDFS are the red lines. And you can see that uh, S3 is like takes way longer than uh, HDFS, right? So four to five x. The other thing is like the amount of jitter is just unimaginable, and it sort of makes sense, right? I mean, this is an environment where people are God knows doing what, right? And we are all sharing the internet, the Ethernet uh, infrastructure inside the cloud. And you see tremendous amount of variation in the latency from S3, right? So even though the best case is pretty good, but like, you know, it, it could be anywhere. So uh, I, I think this particular uh, set of data shows that uh, the latency, the runtime was like about 100, like 95. Uh, but uh, individual runs were like within the range like 75 to 125 or something like that, right? So it's a tremendous amount of variance. So uh, if you go to the forums, you will find that people have asked this question, the, the points I'm raising, and they've said that, well, you know, there's something wrong here. Uh, let's try and use HDFS, right? Let's try and uh, uh, make things more predictable, make things faster. And the, the, the thing that they've come up with is um, copy your data from S3 to SDFS and then start working on them, right? And that, that's a very good approach, very valid approach. Um, but go back to that analyst, right, who's sitting on his desk and just trying to write his query, right? I mean, how the hell is that guy supposed to know that in order to have his query run optimally, he's supposed to copy data from one place to another? So, uh, you know, these are the kind of things that we don't want people to think and, uh, you know, deal with. So what, what, what we've done instead is said, okay, uh, let's just use SDFS as a cache, right? That's what people are doing, right? When, when, when you go to these forums and people say, hey, you know, page in this stuff manually, well, maybe a computer should be doing it for that user instead of the user doing it himself, right? So uh, I'll just go a little bit into like how we build the cache. It's pretty straightforward. So you know, imagine you have a, a cluster. It's a MapReduce cluster, uh, and your data is stored in S3, right? Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. So your query comes along. Uh, we read the data from S3, and we do some magic to sort of uh, start caching it. So the one thing I would point out is that it's not just a simple file cache, but it's actually a columnar cache. So if you take a, a big JSON data which has like you know 15 columns. What we're going to do is like look at what you queried, and actually break it up into uh, uh, columns and uh, cache the data in a columnar format. Uh, and that has like you know gets us like tremendous uh, speed improvements. I'll give some of the numbers uh, going forward. So this is just a bunch of uh, slides. And in the interest of time, let me just skip over. You can see what's happening. Like uh, next time the job comes along, it just like reads from the cache. Pretty straightforward. It doesn't go and read from the original S3 file. Uh, and in the event that you were recycling your cluster, so you went away, the cluster shut down, you came back, we got cluster two instead of one. We still have the columnar representation of the data in S3. That's still a lot faster than reading the original flat file. And so your queries will automatically uh, read that data. And you know, of course, populate it back. Right? So we'll take care of all the you know, expiring things from the cache, you know, making sure that the cache is no more than like a certain number of gigabytes and things like that. Right. So in a nutshell, things are a lot faster and a lot more predictable. So we have seen like uh, speed ups from at least 3x to 5x, and you know I, I think we're still like just getting started. Like there's a lot of uh, optimizations that we still haven't made. So I think there's a lot of headroom here in terms of making things even better. Um, all right. So uh, the other interesting part is well, um, we are using HDFS as a cache. Uh, should we use the same HDFS or should it be a little bit different, right? Because uh, if a node dies, you don't need to re-replicate data. It's just cache data. So, so we've made those changes, right? So if, if when, when nodes go down or they are removed from the cluster, we find out whether the data that they were holding was just a cache data, and we say, okay, well, let's just drop it on the floor, right? We don't need to re-replicate and, like, burden our cluster with all that node. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, just wrapping this up, you know, so these are, like, a couple of, like, sort of, like, deep down things, and but there's a lot of other things we have done. So uh, to sort of... Um, Go back to my point about uh, n not having the analyst to understand how things are implemented. Simple checkbox. Uh, I want a quick and dirty run on this one terabyte data, right? I don't care how you do it. You know, you just give me up to 95% accuracy, or you do, do a sort of, you know, whatever you want to do. So, so what, what we have done is we, we put a checkbox on the site, and there's a bunch of tricks that we have done on the back end. We sample data. We will stop, you know, big jobs at 90th percentile. We have like uh, you know approximate operators for some of the more uh, things that are sort of uh, you know hard to do without sort of complete data like count distance, and uh, you know the analyst just gets back results very very quickly even though they are not fully accurate. Right? 
other features, you know, we, we extract samples to MySQL and uh, let people sort of like test against that, uh, again, in a very, very transparent manner. You know, you don't have to think about whether I'm going against Hive or MySQL. It's just a subset of data, and you can validate your queries and expressions quickly against that smaller data set. Uh, so let me just uh, stop here. Uh, so I just wanted to give a quick gist of what we have built and uh, take some questions. How do you maintain uh, data locality when you add new nodes to the cluster? How do you add, uh, maintain data locality if you are planning to add more nodes to the cluster? Uh, right, so, uh, so if, while, well, you know, you're right, I mean, there's no magic bullet here. So when we resize the cluster and we bring in data, uh, we maintain locality for the duration of those nodes, right? <coughs> so if the data is there while those nodes are running, tasks, I mean, they get locality. Uh, when uh, those nodes are reduced, obviously, you know, we actually, as I mentioned, you know, we just drop the cache data. Uh, so uh, maybe the key thing here is that things are always better than what they would be if you went against S3. That's the key thing. Uh, are you using any sort of uh, compression technique uh, while uh, you're storing data in uh, the cloud? Or And uh, suppose some user uploads a very large number of small files. That's not really optimized uh, to run map MapReduce on. So uh, do you uh, join such small files into uh, multiple bigger files or something? Yeah, so we are using uh, compression for uploading data like in our cache. Uh, we actually uh, made just when we got started, we made a bunch of optimizations to deal with small files. So first of all, you know, we made Hive's combined input format work with the S3 stuff, so things will get combined. Uh, and the second part is we actually also uh, made changes in the way uh, our I.O. Uh, stack deals with S3 so that uh, small file I.O. is optimized. Um, I think there is um, the second part of this question, actually, I think we have not finished doing this stuff. So one part of your question is, well, if you're going to cache a bunch of small files, do they show up then as a bunch of small files in your cache or they are then sort of like packed into something bigger? And longer term, yes, they need to be packed into something bigger, but right now they are not. Uh, how do you tackle your dependency management? Means it, sh it should have lots of dependency. What happens if one of your dependency dies? Can you raise your hand? Uh, what happens if one of your dependency dies? And, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the dependency management system, uh, we built a V1, so uh, we have uh, used Uzi, but we actually had to implement mostly the stuff actually was, uh, has been re-implemented. So we, um, uh, our basic pattern is that we uh, use data dependency and not job dependency. So uh, when you say learn this query, uh, you say that, okay, the data I depend on are, for example, the partitions from uh, yesterday. And uh, those are things that we have built into our Uzi stack where, uh, uh, you know, our sort of Uzi coordinator will take care of depending on those uh, partitions and only then spawning your query. Thank you, Jaydeep. Right, right. Thank you so much.